Moving. Hi, everybody. Can you see me? Sorry, I seem to be frozen. Not that cold. Well, no, it's not that close. Lovely and warm in here, but I just can't see anything. Can you leave me in the comments if you can see me so I at least know I'm talking to someone? You can call. Thanks, Maureen. I've frozen in time. So, all righty. How are you all? Welcome to our show tonight. I'm Kath from the Cheap Cats Club. The voice in the hand over here will be Hannah. She'll wave or talk or do something sometime during the show. I'm so glad you could join us. It's um, Tuesday, the 21st of July, 2020. This is a live show. So if you're looking at it tomorrow, it's not live. You'll be seeing the replay. That's okay because it'll still be good and worth watching. How's your week been? Oh, my gosh. So much has happened here in the last week. We had a, um, a Zoom card day, card making day with our, our card group. That was not a Zoom, a, um, I don't know live messenger do wacky what's it type card day which worked really really well and it was so nice to be able to see my friends in person if not exactly in the same room and chat to them and of course Melbourne's in lockdown and now from tomorrow. midnight tomorrow night oh. Wednesday night we have to wear face masks or coverings when we leave the house. If we don't, it's a $200 on the spot fine and maybe that's not high enough because I've already been um, listening to the comments and people saying it's inconvenient and they can't be bothered and they're not going to be told what to do, yada, yada, yada. And I'm like, oh, seriously, folks, just suck it up. And then I thought, seriously, folks, grow up. Anyway, enough of that. So I've been busy this week making face masks for friends and family and other people, which is really good. So that's kept me busy too, as well as working on our new website, slowly coming together. You may have noticed some changes happening if you logged in today. There's um, a few things that are different. Login is still the same for the time being. It will be the last thing to change. But the look of the place is starting to change. It's slowly, slowly coming together, and I'm really pleased about that. It's a huge job. It's 20-odd um, years of stuff to go through and sort out and cull and it's taking ages, but we will get there. Now, before we get on to tonight's topic, which I can't wait to, to hear your ideas, I've got some happy mail to see, share with you. I've been a bit remiss, but I have it to share. I want to show you. See, I got this really cute card from the lovely Maureen who said that yes she could see me so that was really good with a nice message inside it and yes all is well as she knows cute little flowers isn't she clever I'm sure she embellished it and made it all pretty for me herself and then I received a really cute <laughs> cute little card and an article about that um, reminded, what's the message say? Hi, Kat. The article on the other side, I know it's old, reminded me of your philosophy of free, independent of budgets and timelines, debt free, cashed up and laughing. That's me. So that was nice and really interesting reading. And I'll see if I can. Um, it's from a November 2015 Gardening Australia magazine, so it is a bit old. Um, Michael blogs at The Gardenist. .com.au if you want to read it. It's a really, it's a nice little read. And then I had this note and a big parcel. I get excited when I get big parcels. Hi, Kath. Sorry to hear you are unwell worn out. Thank you. Hope this kitchen warming gift cheers you up. Keep safe. Meryl Williams. It's so cute. I might have to stand up and show you. 
Because look, it's an ice cream. Is it showing up, Bob? Yep. I can't answer. How cute is that? It's blue because it's my favourite colour. And it's got our Chief Skates piggy on it. Isn't that just good? And it's like it's got big fluffy nose. It's just you know, little eyes. It's so cute. So thank you very much, ladies. Happy Mail really made me happy. It was really exciting when I got all these things. And I have been very slack in saying thank you. But I really do appreciate it. It was lovely. Now, I'll move back in a bit. My bouncing around, sorry. Um, this isn't the show I was planning to do when I was thinking about this over the weekend. But yesterday, uh, a friend of mine in the US sent me this list of things that it was a generic sort of going around lessons learned from the Great Depression and there were a couple of links that I then followed on with talking about, you know, what the banks in the US are going to do and how they're actually in a depression even though the government's calling it a recession and how it's affecting different things. And then another blog I follow, and I know some of you do The Prudent Homemaker, she was talking about how she is um, looking to keep her pantry stocked constantly instead of eating it down, like much like I do. I do my bulk of the shopping once a year and we usually just eat it down. Well, this year I've been, as we use it, I've been restocking. It just seems wise. I'm not panicking and I don't want you to panic, but I just think it's wise being able to feed my family, keep my family and home clean, maintain our lifestyle is very important to me. That's, that's my job as wife and mother, to look after my family. And that's my safety blanket. My security blanket is knowing I can do those things, which is why I keep the pantry as full as it is and why I'm on the ball with the toiletries and the cleaning supplies and the seeds and things so that we don't run out of things because I look on that as part of my responsibility of caring for my family and knowing I've got those things ready is my security blanket. So while we haven't gone without anything we've needed during this pandemic, no, we haven't gone without a thing, have we? No, nope, just the oven. Yeah, just the kitchen. <laughs> um, I don't ever want to be in that position where I don't and where, where we have to. So... I just do my regular shopping and restock as we do it. There's certainly no panic buying. There's certainly no hoarding going on. But I would encourage everyone to have a quick look at your pantries, whether you live in Melbourne, rural Victoria, Tasmania, New South Wales, wherever you live, New Zealand, the USA. We've got people from all over the world. Have a quick look, and if there's any gaps in your pantry, figure out how you can fill them. Because hmm, being a good steward isn't foolish, it's wise. And you never know what's going to happen tomorrow. So the way things are going here at the moment, unemployment's on the rise, and in fact it's at an all-time high. I don't, I don't think it was this high, maybe just a little fraction high during the Great Depression. So it's things are really tough for a lot of people. We're lucky that we have no debt. We don't carry any debt. We have our emergency fund. We're blessed that that's taken us a long time to do. It wasn't easy and we made sacrifices to do it. It didn't just happen, but we did it. So now we have those things. So when these um, list of things popped up, I was thinking, oh, that's interesting, that's interesting, that's interesting. And I decided that we'd turn it into a bit of a series because I know you guys are full of ideas, absolutely chock full of them because you talk about them here in the comments and you message me about them and on Facebook and on the chatter page. So I know between us all there's um, a mind-blowing amount of knowledge and huge amount of skills that can get us through tough times. So part one I would like to talk about is work because that seems to be the thing 
I've been hearing a lot about the last couple of weeks is um, being put off because of COVID-19, having hours cut because of the restrictions, um, people, you know, self-employed people suddenly finding that they're no longer employed because they can't work in their profession, their chosen fields, what they would do, how are they going to survive. So we're going to talk about work. When disaster struck, it was awful for us. Now, some of you know this story. It was awful for us. We had a mortgage. Interest rates were topping 18%. We had friends paying 21% on their mortgage. Uh, we lived in a country town where Wang's employer was the only one that actually employed someone with his skills in his trade and he'd been put off. We had a three-year-old and a two-year-old, half the house because we are starting to renovate and then we found out we are having another baby. I lost my job on the Thursday. Wayne lost his on the Friday. We found out Hannah was coming along on the Monday. And Australia at that time was in recession. Again, it was awful. We had a mortgage that we had to pay because we needed to keep a roof over our heads. We had two little boys that we had to feed because little boys don't understand there's no food in the cupboard and there's no money in mummy's purse to buy food. And a baby coming along that was going to wear her brother's clothes because we couldn't afford to buy baby girl clothes. It was a bit of a disaster. So we had to find work. Now, being pregnant wasn't that easy for me to get a job. And it wasn't easy because we would have had to put two boys in childcare and then I was only going to be temporary anyway till the baby came along. Wayne did whatever he could. He picked strawberries by hand. He picked tomatoes by hand. He ploughed paddocks. He did fencing. He um, drove tractors. Um, he drove harvesters. He helped in the shearing shed at shearing time. He got contract work at the local council and drove their road rollers. He would get up at 3 o'clock in the morning in the middle of a river in the winter when it would be minus 6 and walk the feedlot to make sure the cows were ready, um, were fed on time and ready to be transported. He did whatever he could. I did ironing. I know, hard to believe, but I did it. I don't do it anymore. Well, I do, but not often. I did ironing. I took an ironing because I could do that at home with the boys. When the boys were asleep or at night or early in the morning, whenever, I could do the ironing. And I had it as so it was a pick-up. I had to pick it up and drop it off, drop it off and pick it up so that I didn't have to travel because we didn't have the money for the petrol in the car for me to do that, even with being paid to do the ironing. And I only charged $7 a basket. It was a long time ago. Wish you could get that done now. I also um, did um, taught creative tapestry. I'm a guild accredited tapestry teacher. So I taught tapestry lessons at home three nights a week, put the kids to bed, turn our family room into a classroom, taught tapestry. I did that. I learned to swap things with friends who had things. I babysat for a friend who was a nurse whose husband um, was a truck driver. So when he would have to be away, I would look after her kids. We did whatever we could to put money on the table. And that's what they did during the depression. They worked together as, as, well, as a family. Our kids were too little at the time, but as a family to just be able to eat. And whole families would move. They'd move together because it was easier to um, support each other if they were together. So whole families would pack up their homes and move. We, we packed up our home, eventually packed up our home and, and came to Melbourne. Um, so they, they had a, a good work ethic. They tried any job. They might have been a teacher, but if there were no teaching positions available, they 
pulled weeds in gardens or mowed lawns or um, worked in the supermarket. They did whatever they could to earn an honest living. And that's something that I think we forget sometimes that just because we've trained as a neurosurgeon doesn't mean we can't do anything else. Of course we can. If there's no work in the neurosurgery field, then we find a job doing something else. It may not be what we're trained for and it may feel like we've wasted our education or whatever, but don't ever think that any job is beneath you. It's not. If it is honest work and it, you earn your pay honestly, it is not beneath you. This attitude of, well, you know, I'm a X, Y, Z and this is a job for an ABC is wrong. Don't think like that. Work is work and money in your pocket is money in your pocket. So if you need money and someone offers you a job ironing and it's not your favourite thing to do, doesn't mean you can't do it. Of course you can. So you need to take whatever you can whatever you can get, whenever you can get it. Um, especially if uh, you rely or have come to rely on, what do they call it now, job seeker, because that's going to go away. It's dropping down and it's eventually going to go away. So you need to be able to support yourselves. Um, during the Depression, everyone worked from the tiniest toddler to the oldest grandparents. Everyone worked. They all pulled their weight. They all did their job. I was talking to another friend today and she has 11 children and they raised their kids the same way. They did whatever they could and they had a friend who was a builder and on weekends he would employ them to clean his houses do the final clean of them, all the kids came and all the kids had a job to do and all the kids pitched in and helped to do that job for the extra benefit for the family. Everyone pulls their weight. So Okay, so I need to move this over because I'm missing comment. I can see comments, but I just can't see anything else. Okay. So no one was too proud to take a job. If it was going to earn them enough to buy a meal to feed their family that night, they did it. So be grateful we live in 2021 and it's not quite 2020. 2020. Oh, sorry, I've jumped ahead a year. Be grateful we live in 2020 and, you know, jobs are not as labour intensive as they were, you know, 80 years ago, but or 90 years ago. So, you know, it's actually easier for us to do other things now. All right. Um, back to basics with meals, grow more. Okay, so, and this is, I've just been, sorry, I'm watching some of the comments too. Um, Maureen said her nana always says take care of the pennies and the pounds will look after themselves and that's exactly true and I believe that's a Benjamin Franklin quote although it's been accredited to Benjamin Franklin maybe that's an urban myth I don't know um, and yep Barb Woodford Grandma always said little fish are sweet, which means, you know, little things are worth it. And lots of mask making happening, Delaney, Sherry. And there was one more I saw and, and from Maureen too, and nothing was wasted. And that's my next point. Everything, everything had a value. So a stick on the side of the road became firewood. Um, Cardboard became the inner soles of shoes or it became book bindings or it became 
something to write on or it became a fire lighter. They didn't have plastic so much in the Depression, the plastic bags and things, but paper was kept. If it was good paper, it was ironed carefully and reused for other things. Food wasn't wasted. Food scraps weren't composted or fed to the fed to the fed to the chooks. They were used. Apple cores and apple peelings were boiled up and made to make apple drink or apple jelly. They weren't wasted. Orange peels were dried and used. Um, as fire lighters or to burn to keep the mosquitoes away, that sort of thing. Vegetables weren't peeled. They were scrubbed really well and the peels were eaten because there's a lot of nutrition in most of those peels, so don't throw them away. Little things like that, bread crusts were never turned into breadcrumbs like we do today. They were turned into a pudding, a bread pudding, or rissoles to, or fritters, bread fritters to feed the family it wasn't wasted and it wasn't given to the chooks it wasn't given to the dog or the cat or the pigs or whatever they got the absolute they got scraps but they got real scraps not what we call scraps today we are really we are still really wasteful even if we think we're not we are still really wasteful pumpkin seeds were dried and roasted and eaten they're delicious hannah's turning her nose up but they're delicious i'm sure all of you have had Salted pumpkin seeds at some stage, they're really oh, good. Salted, that's good. Yeah, you dry them and roast them, you put some salt on them and eat them. They're a good snack and they're actually quite nutritious. All those things, nothing was wasted. If you had an overcoat that was worn out, it was cut down. It might have been turned into um, trousers and a jacket for a child. And when that wore out, it was turned into something else and turned into something else. Nothing was wasted. Buttons were kept, zippers were kept. How many of us have our grandma's button jar or button tin? Yep, Hannah's got her hand up. I have my great-grandmother's um, tin that I should have got it out to show you. It's an old, really pretty, very bashed about now, um, cake tin. And when it came to me, it was full of, Semco embroidery cottons, embroidery cotton, stranded cotton that you do cross stitch and stuff with, and all wound on little bobbins. And some of the most beautiful Semco transfers that are really expensive if you can get your hands on them today, absolutely gorgeous. That was kept. And socks were darned. And socks, work socks were darned with wool. Good socks, the one pair of good socks for church was were darned with the strand of cotton because it was softer and finer so the fine for the better socks was better than darning with wool um tea towels were mended sheets were turned they weren't hole in the sheet didn't mean it was ruined it was turned and that simply meant that it was trimmed down and re-hemmed and flipped over and They'd turn it three and four and five times to make that sheet last. Pillowcases, same deal. Lots of clothes had embroidery on them to hide a patch. So, uh, I just saw Joy had broccoli from her garden and lettuce and a sandwich from, from the garden at lunch. Lovely. Um, Broccoli stems were used. Now, I know that lots of us still use the broccoli stems, but there's a lot of people that throw them away because they think they can't eat them. Of course they can. The beetroot leaves might go really well in a salad. So eat the leaves and keep the beets for something else. They're really good roasted. Um, nothing was wasted. Flower sacks were made into clothes. Um, they were made into um, beautiful quilts, absolutely stunning patchwork quilts. I have some, hmm, I think Joy's our quilter, she might know too. I have some reproduction flower sacks stashed away to make a quilt with. They're absolutely gorgeous. In Australia, they had these things called woggers and 
they were made from, they were blankets and they were made from the Hessian sacks and they were called woggers. Um, if you couldn't, you know, couldn't afford a blanket, that's what you used. Nothing was wasted. <laughs> Jules been watching on the TV, but she can't comment on the TV. Do I look better on TV because I'm bigger? Um, I watch some of the YouTube shows on TV too. Um, I think button jars should be just a fun thing to have. I loved going through my grandma's button jar. Um, heap of socks. Good on you, Maureen. <laughs> Joy says socks can be turned into masks now. And Maureen said not footy socks. I agree, Maureen, not footy socks. I saw their clip on YouTube with the Dutch lady turning the sock into a mask. And I thought that's really good. You just have to remember to so be clean. odd socks and make sure they're clean. Signal girl, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, your green grocery bags, yes, they can. You just need to double layer them, bub. Um, it's not as nice to wear, though. If you're going to wear a mask, if you're going to wear a homemade mask, this is off topic, folks, if you're going to wear a homemade mask, make sure it's comfortable and make sure it's out of a cotton that's soft enough, a fabric that's soft enough to wear. Um, and the other thing is if you're making them, instead of doing a tie there and a tie there so that they, right, I do them so that they're, Elastic is actually in a little tiny bit in the side and I do it like that because when you put it on, that actually gathers up and fits tightly there. There's no gap. Whereas if you're doing the masks with the ties, there is a gap sort of around that from your cheekbone to your chin sort of area that lets your cough, sneezes, whatever's out. So... Try and get a mask that fits snugly across your nose, under your chin and around the side of your face. Off my, off my mask hobby horse now. Um, uh, ah, Joyce Cena Wagga. Cool. Hi, Susan. There's one in New South Wales. No, in New South Wales it's a Wagga Wagga. <laughs> All righty. Now. Lynn, I bought my husband a lovely jumper in Peru. After many years, it was full of holes, but I was able to give it a second life by getting out the darning mushroom, yep, and spending a couple of hours. I have a jumper that I did that. I bought it my first trip to New Zealand. I bought this beautiful jumper in Queenstown, absolutely stunning, blue and green, loved it. Came home, wore it and wore it and wore it, and oh, when we got married, it got put away, and I brought it out again one winter, and it had a little hole in it from a silverfish or a moth or something in it. And, yeah, I very carefully darned it to, to keep wearing it. It was a beautiful jumper. Um, my mask, is that Outback 6? Okay. Mm -hmm. My mask is really easy to make. I'll quickly, quickly dinner plate. So about um, 30 centimetres across, you'll need a dinner plate. Trace your circle around it, cut it out. Fold it in half with right sides together. Then on the curved edge, start at one end, stitch down about, mm, I eyeball it, but about two inches and stop. Leave about two and a half inches and then start stitching again around that edge to the other side. You leave that little gap for the pocket. Then what you do, I don't have any cut out ones here to show you. You've got it stitched so it's like a slice of watermelon. Put the seams together, match the seams up, pull it tight and stitch across the, that end. Put your fingers inside the pocket, pull it through, 
spread it all out nice and flat. Take the pointy ends, fold them over about an inch. You don't need to go over too far. Give them a stitch across there and that's where you thread your elastic. Now, I, in the masks I've been making, I've left the elastic tidy a knot because there's nothing worse than having it too tight. I'm not being lazy. I just, if I'm, I've delivered so many this week and I'm just sending them out willy-nilly. Well, not willy-nilly, they're going to places, but I've been going flat chat. So it's just easier then for when you get it, you can, you can adjust it yourself um, just like that. But that makes a double layer and there's the pocket where you can put your filter. Now, it can be a tissue. It can be um, folded cloth. It could be a cotton makeup pad. It could be, if you can get a, a N95 filter, not the mask, you can get the filters. It, it could be one of those. If you're going to use these masks, just remember you need a few because you need to change them reasonably often. As soon as they get damp, they actually stop working as well. So carry a few with you so you can swap through the day. With Wayne, I will be sending four or five to, with him each day because as you're wearing them and chatting, chatting, chatting and breathing, just breathing, they get damp. So you need to be able to change them out. That's the recommendation from Johns Hopkins. When I was looking to make sure I was telling people the right thing, that's what I, the information I found from Johns Hopkins. I figure they're a reputable, it's a reputable um Medical centre, it should be telling us at least something sane and sensible. So that's what I would suggest. But cotton fabric, some people have said um, to get, um, oh, what is it? It's um, uh, not quite water. It, it makes it really hard to breathe. It's so tightly woven it makes it really hard to breathe. That's not going to work. Um because it will be impossible to breathe. It will be really hard. Now, I've tried a couple of different disposables over the last couple of weeks, just going in and out, and there was one we had that was just awful, and it turned out to be the most expensive. It was $5 for one mask. Put it on, you just could not breathe. It just did not let you get any air in or out at all. So you need to watch that sort of thing too if you're going to do your mask. Um, I will try and do um, a post on the website about the masks for you. Um, just give me a couple of hours to do it. I had been thinking about it. It's really, they're really easy to do, but that's the easiest way to do it. But try and use cotton fabric because then it will wash. You can do it in a hot wash if you want to. But the, they say just toss them into the ordinary and your regular laundry load and make sure they're dry. So if you've got a dryer, putting them through the dryer might help or out in the sunshine will also help if you're lucky enough to have sunshine. It's been a bit grey here this week. All right. Joy, dinner plate pattern I found was I tried the pleated ones and I didn't like them. They didn't fit properly over my nose or around the sides of my face. This dinner, dinner plate pattern one is a really good fit. And I think we were talking about it at the weekend. You can make them bigger or smaller as you need to by just making a bigger circle. Um, so, yeah, if you've got someone with a really big head, make, you know, more elastic on the ears. This is just skinny elastic too. It's um, only three mil elastic. It's really skinny, but it's very soft. So it's not pulling on your ear. Um, there's nothing, you know, if you've got glasses that are too tight or something, it hurts. So this is this three mil elastic I've had for a gazillion years. Um, it's really soft. Um, so I think I saw a thing before where there's going to be a national elastic shortage, but I don't oh, know. I'm not <laughs> um, thank 
you joy, they are part of the make do and mend mentality. And look, they only use a little bit of fabric. So 30 centimetre square roughly will make a mask. Easily make a mask, an adult size mask. So you don't need a lot of fabric to make them. Um, There's a gazillion. If you go onto YouTube, you will find thousands of mask videos, tutorials, all sorts of things. Um, some of them are really complicated. Some of them are really simple. It takes, once I got into the hang of these, I started batch making them because people were messaging me left, right and centre saying, can I have, can I have, can I have? How many can I get? How many can I get? No, if you don't care what colour it is, I'll just make them and send them. Um, once I got into the batch habit of, you know, cutting them all out, then ironing them all, then, you know, stitching them all, it was really easy. The hardest part was tying the knots in the elastic. My fat fingers don't work too well. Um, you can use repurposed. Product uh, fabrics, Delaney, Duna covers, cotton sheets, cotton pillow slips. Um, you should get four from, a, from four from one pillow slip, at least four big ones from one pillow slip. Just make sure they're cotton. Um, if you run out of elastic, by the way, you can use bias tape for the same way. You'll just have to tie it to go over your ear, or um, I've seen some people use the hair stickies, the scrun um, not scrunchies, the little furry ponytail holder things, you know, the ones that are about that big, the stretchy ones, or ribbing, cut some ribbing. Ribbing comes in a band so you can trim it down, same deal. T-shirt material. Um, hi, Barb, you're not rude. Um, T-shirt yarn instead of elastic on her mask. Yes. It's nice and soft. Anything soft. Um, it's, no, I don't mind wearing them. I don't mind wearing them. The kids, even the boys. Um, Thomas came shopping with me last week to help me and he was fine. I said to him, are you going to mask up? And this was before we even had the, the order to wear masks here. Are you going to put gloves and a mask on? And he went, yep. And he did. He didn't hesitate. So that was really, I thought that was really good. Um, I just said to him, thank you, so I don't look stupid on my own. But I noticed last Thursday, <laughs> and it's in hysterics, last Thursday when we were at Coles, we were sort of, we go in, we get what we want, come out. We don't linger any longer. But just about everyone had at least a mask on and lots of people had gloves on too. So it was really interesting. It'll be interesting to see what happens on Thursday with everyone going, oh, I'm not going to wear a mask. Oh, I have rights, yada, yada, yada. So, hmm. All righty. So. All righty. Now. Okay, um, way back in the Depression, especially here in Australia, the doll was new. It didn't really exist. It was, it was something that was introduced, I think, for the Depression, and someone might be able to double-check that for me, but I have it in my mind. And so it was very new, and it was really hard to get, and it wasn't much. There were queues of people. People would, you know, start lining up before dawn outside a factory in case there was a chance of, a, of work for the day or down at the docks or in the railway yards or if they were in the country town, it might have been at cattle yards or sale yards or, or you know, at a farm somewhere. They would be um, lining up before dawn in the hope that they would get a day's work. So... Um, Having unemployment to rely on wasn't just didn't exist. It was different for them. They had to work where now we are blessed in that we have a system in place that at least gives some support. 
Um, there was no such thing as retirement age. That's, yeah, it's very new thing, you know, retiring at 65. What are you laughing at? Joy's making her on, masks with figures and tractors on it from her cool home stash. Maureen's making a mask with the stash that Wendy gave her. Hers have flies on them. Flies, as in bzz, Louis the fly? Really? Cool. I'm, I've got some, I did a crossword one this afternoon and I have some um, with farm, little red farm um, sheds coming up. So otherwise I've been raiding my stash of pretty florals that I've been saving for goodness only knows what. <laughs> no wow. point in keeping them. No point in keeping them. Might as well share the love. Um, there was no such thing as retirement age. Nobody retired. You worked till you dropped. Um, now, it's really interesting because I've been trying to talk Wayne into going down, dropping um, to three days a week work and having, you know, having a sort of long weekend. And we were talking about this and I, I think that would be wonderful. And from my way of working our budget and things, we would manage just fine. And he looked at me and said, Oh, I'm going to work for at least another 10 years. And I, oh my goodness, he'll be as old as Methuselah before he thinks he's going to retire. Oh my gosh, in his mind, he's never going to retire. He is always going to work. And I thought, well, that's really interesting because I've always said I don't think I'd retire because I can always do this unless something terrible happens and I lose the power of speech. I will always be able to do this. So... It was interesting that hmm, we neither of us actually think of retiring as in giving up work. I think of retiring for us would be giving us more options so that we can do more travelling and things that we want to do, but not necessarily giving up work. And during the Depression, you just didn't, you just worked. You didn't even think of stopping working. You just worked until you didn't, couldn't physically work any longer. It was the way it was. It was a, a matter of anyone who could contribute to the family did. And maybe, maybe we need more of that too. Um, a lot of jobs became part-time because employers couldn't afford full-time employees. So instead of putting them off completely, they cut their hours back to part-time. Now, we've seen that happen. That's been happening in Australia for the last, easily the last 35 years. Gradually, full-time jobs are becoming fewer and fewer and part-time and casual work has been taking over. So that's an interesting thing. But they tried really hard to at least keep some sort of work and keep some of their employees going, which is really good. So perhaps that could be an option if you find that you have the choice of part-time work, full-time work or no work, perhaps going part-time might help. Um, nobody sat around and said, hmm, I need to find a job. Oh, I need to find a job. Oh, I need to find a job. They actually got off their patootsies and went, Door knocking. They, like I said, they lined up in the morning to find out work. Now you may not be able to do that here, but you can certainly knock on doors. And I, in, I think, knocking on the door, saying, "My name's Joe Bloggs, and I'm looking for a job. This is my CV. If you've got anything going, please consider me." Is leaves a much better impression than. Um, just sending an, a generic email. So if you find yourselves looking for work, some sort of work, physically, actively looking for it, could well find, well, it actually could get you the job of your dreams. Um, this one really resonates with me because it's sort of what I did back, back when we had no money and things were tough, 
people created jobs for themselves. So I created Cheapskate. That became my, my job. Um, I have a friend who cleans houses. That became her job. Um, I have another friend who does mending. That's her job. That's how she supplements their family income. She takes in mending. I have another friend who has a huge flower garden, absolutely glorious flower garden, and she sells three times a year, she sells her flowers. She sells them for a huge amount of money and that's how she supplements their income. Now, she's really blessed because she loves working in that garden and she loves growing those flowers, so it's no effort to her. My friend that does the mending quite enjoys sewing. She doesn't mind little jobs. Little jobs, she says little jobs are quick and easy and over and done with. She doesn't have time to get bored. So, But it brings in an income. They do. They made work for themselves. They found work themselves and they created their own jobs. Um, so, wow, Barbara, your father worked for 62 years. Bet you thought he was never going to retire. <laughs> Barb likes a crossword mask. Okay, Kathleen, you can't always do what you love. You know, finding a job that you love is wonderful, but you can't always, you don't always have that option. I can't do what I love. No, you can't. But if, if you find yourself unemployed and you have no money and you've got bills and you need to eat and you need to have somewhere to live, you take whatever job you can get. You can keep looking for your dream job by all means, but don't not work just because it's not the, your dream job and you're not going to love it. Yes, it is harder to get up in the morning and go to work at a job that you don't like, but you need to remember it's only for a short time because you're still looking for something else. You're going to find that dream job okay, eventually and you're still going to be able to survive. So... While I think doing what you love is a really nice thing to have, to be able to do, it's not always possible. It's not always feasible. See, now this is interesting. From Joy says she, um, she cooked and sewed and sold it all at Sunday markets for years until she got a proper job. Oh, so annoying, Joy. That was a proper job. It was a proper job. So you've always had proper jobs and you've always been a working wife and mother. Um, yeah, Jessica, try to find something to enjoy on what you do and it will make it easier. I had a job oh, before we were married. Actually, before I started going out with Wayne, loathed, loathed that job. Absolutely loathed it. And the man I was working for was awful. He was, he was a monster. He was just horrible. But every lunchtime, I would go into the staff room, and there, and I would just, I actually go into the factory staff room, not the office staff room and have my lunch with the, the men and women off the factory floor and we would laugh and I would be able to go back to my office and do that work till 5 o'clock knowing that at least they were, they were kind, they were funny, they were interested in what we, I was doing, what everyone else was doing. They weren't going to yell at me just because they felt like it. It was really, yeah, I had to find something that was good about that job and the whole time I was there, I was looking for something else because I'd only been there a couple of days and I just knew it wasn't going to work out. That was the shortest job I've ever had in my life. Um, yeah. Oh, sorry, Kathleen, I thought you meant looking for work. Yeah, finding something you love to do in retirement is really important. If, you, if you're a worker and you're not used to being inactive, retirement can be devastating and really depressing. 
you need to you need to have something to do. And I know a lot of people um, talk about you know how their husbands are suddenly retired and vanually climbing the walls because it's well, what are you going to do now? How long are you going to be? Where are you going? What do you, why do you do that? They nearly go mental because they have nothing. They haven't had anything planned to do. Yeah, plan your life. At least have some idea. And perhaps if, as your new retirement age, perhaps you need to start looking for some hobbies and some interests and of, to fill your time. I won't have a problem. I'm going to sew, I'm going to knit, I'm going to read, I'm going to spend more time in my garden, we're going to go around Australia and do that big lap eventually. Oh, so many things I can do. I didn't see the speech marks, Joy. Sorry, I just saw. No, it was a problem. I say that because when I first started Cheapskate, I had even family members would say to me, well, when are you actually going to get a job? Are you ever going to work? And then this was, Wayne must be very worried about money with him being the sole breadwinner. Hmm, it was interesting. I was quieter back then, so I didn't say much. They said it to me now, they probably wouldn't leave with a head. Anyway, make cards, Kath. Yes, I'll make cards, Bob. Um, All right. Okay, now, flexibility helped. Sorry. We've talked, this, you know, this is flexibility helped and they don't mean, you know, doing your stretching, whatever they mean, being prepared to take anything that's given to you. Um, someone who knew, oh, someone who knew a little about lots of things had a better chance of finding work than someone who was an expert at one. And that's true. Um, what do they say? Jack of all trades, master of none. If you can do a little bit of lots of things, you have more options open to you. It's a bit like stocking ingredients in the pantry. You've got more options. Okay. And be prepared to barter. Now, we do need money to survive. You know, we've got, you know, I'm sure you can't ring up Origin Energy and say, look, I can give you three dozen eggs and two cabbages um, if you want my, you know, in trade for my power bill because that won't work. But someone else might be more than happy to take your three dozen eggs and two cabbages for something that you need that they have. Bartering is a skill. It's funny. It's mm. It's always been around. Um, some of you might know about, I don't even know if it's still around, the Let's bartering system. That was really handy. Um, but just bartering between friends, between your neighbours, between work colleagues, um, people down the street that you've never known, you know. They might have a lemon tree full of lemons and you've got a garden full of um, cauliflowers. See if you can swap. Do some bartering or, you know, something like that. Because, yes, we do still need money, but we need other things too. So if you can do a trade, why not? Um, the note I'm reading is mostly for farmers who would take on workers um, and they couldn't pay them, so they'd pay them in produce instead, which meant that they could then go and sell that produce um, for the cash. I don't know if they still do that. I don't think they'd be allowed to do that anymore. But you know what? Ah, push comes to shove. We do what we have to do. All righty. So, gosh, I've waffled on a lot tonight. Sorry, mm -hmm. folks. Hannah's going, mm -hmm, mm hmm But I just thought it's really interesting that we're talking at we're in a recession. The reading I was doing today was saying, you know, the US government is calling it a recession, but the US economists are calling it a depression. That interested me. Then I was reading how the banks are um, gearing up for a, a huge um, crash 
um, within the next four months. So that sort of hurt me up a bit or tweaked me. I had me thinking a bit, you know. And I, then I remembered that um, Roseanne sent this and so I was watching it. I thought that would make a really good um, topic for us to talk about because I remember the recession in the 1990s because I lived through it. I don't remember anything before then. Um, I've never lived through a crisis like this. I've never lived through something like this. this. What is happening every day is new to me. So I'm learning on the fly and I guess most of us are because we've not ever been faced with something like this in Australia before. So, yes, we've had recessions. And, yes, we've had, you know, unemployment go up and go down and inflation go up and sort of things happen. And then we had the GFC and before that there was the um, tech crash and those sorts of things. But nothing that seems to have impacted our economy quite like this has. So it's going to be really interesting how we come out of it. And I think we need to prepare and we need to... Um, not panic, but we need to prepare because, you know what, if we prepare and it's not needed, then we can take it easy for a few months after it's over. But if we don't prepare and we find we do need it, then we're going to be scrabbling and that's going to be when it's hard. We don't want to live harder. We want to live smarter. So being a little bit prepared doesn't hurt. All right, now. Ooh, Barb, I would, I, Barb's, I would like that sort of swap because um, cooking tea nearly drives me out. I'm not a tea cooker. It's not my favourite thing to do. Karen, hi, Karen, how are you? We have a skill we need to ensure that we value that skill and not have others expect mates, right? Yes, that's true, but uh, you need to be realistic in your valuing of your skills. Hannah's a qualified hairdresser. Now, she's a proper qualified hairdresser. She did a hairdressing apprenticeship. She didn't just do a two-month tape course. So, and she does do some hairdressing here at home, but she doesn't charge salon rates. And she doesn't charge salon rates for a number of reasons. Firstly, she doesn't have the salon overheads. But also... They're highly inflated. Those salon rates are highly inflated for the value of the job. So we look for the value of the job. Okay, take my face masks, for instance. Now, I've got them in our blog shop, and I put them on for $7, and that includes the postage. When I was trying to work out the price to set them, I did some searching. They're anything from $5 to $28. Each, each, $5 to $28 each for a, hand, a homemade, handmade cloth mask. Hmm. So I couldn't, there's no way, I can't see $28 worth of value in that. I can't. I can see $7 worth of value in that because it costs $2.20 to post and the fabric and the time the power to run the machines because I overlock all the edges, then I stitch it, then there's the elastic. So there's $7 worth of value in that and I'm happy with that. I can't overvalue that. It's the same when I was teaching tapestry and working tapestries. Now, I have worked tapestries on commission. To work a tapestry on commission back when I was doing it, which is before Flossy was born, so that's 25 years ago, mm -hmm. 25 years ago, I was charging $1.50 a square inch. Now, that can work out to many hundreds of dollars for just a smallish canvas to be worked. There were other people that were charging a lot more than that. Some of them were charging up to three times as much. There's, I couldn't see the value in that. I wasn't undervaluing my skill, but I was being realistic in what my skill was worth. So, yeah. Ooh, that's a great 
quote, Delaney, now's the time to implement the changes we want to sustain into the future. Yep, cool. Um, okay, so, all right. Thank you, Jokey. Now, I knew you didn't, I knew you meant to be realistic, Karen. I was just clarifying. Trust me. Um, uh, all righty. So, next week we'll do part two, whatever it is. Hopefully, I will, won't be stuck in limbo like I am now. And oh, yeah, it does look terrible. <laughs> I saw my hand, I'm half frowning, and I've got my head down, and you can see all the grey. And oh my gosh! All righty, folks. Thank you so much. If you've liked tonight's show, please give us a thumbs up. If you haven't already subscribed, please do. And I will. Um, thanks, Bob. I will do the post with the instructions for the face masks and get it up onto the Chief Skates Club website as quickly as I can. Just be aware that things are looking a bit higgledy-piggledy because we've started the transition, but it will be there for you. Okay. Have a great week, everyone, and I shall see you next Tuesday. Thank you so much for joining us and good night. <laughs>